أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا إنه من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له الواحد الأحد الفرد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح للأمة فكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين فصلوات ربي وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Indeed all praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we thank him, we praise him, we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the evil within us and our wrongdoings. For those whom Allah guide, no one can misguide. And those whom Allah leaves, no one can guide them to the straight path. I bear witness that there is no God, Lord, or deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his final messenger and prophet. May peace and blessings be upon him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah reminds us in the Holy Quran, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O oh, you who believe, have taqwa in Allah, have fear, have God consciences in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the manner that he is most deserving of subhanah and do not leave do not leave this world except in a state of Islam. My dear brothers and sisters, we are in the summer months and a lot of the children are now away from school, maybe have a little more energy and a little more time. And I wanted to use this opportunity, use this opportunity to reflect on how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt with some of the youngsters. How the Prophet ﷺ dealt with children and with youth. And this is a reminder to us as adults more than it is for the children. It's, it's for the olders and how we can uh, learn from the Prophet ﷺ. And so I'll give a few examples and then maybe some pointers at the end inshaAllah. So the first is a hadith of an Arabi, a Bedouin who came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam أَتُقَبِّلُونَ الصَّبِيَانِ فَمَا نُقَبِّلُهُمْ Do you kiss your young boys? We don't. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam respond 
أو أملك لك أن نزع الله الرحمة من قلبك Do I what, what can I do for you if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has removed mercy from your heart and, I, and I'm reflecting on this because alhamdulillah I think the majority of us will show love and compassion to our youngsters but sometimes there's a stigma in how we are as men how we are as adults and what we can or can't show to those who are younger than us and again this Arabi came from a place of hardship people in the desert people of a certain cultural norm and the Prophet وسلم, is basically saying that this cultural norm does not fit with what Islam is teaching us this cultural norm that the Arabi is coming from is a cultural norm of not showing mercy to those young ones and a form of showing mercy to them is kissing them a form of showing love to our children and, and if we can't do that then we need to reflect maybe we are in a position of where this Arabi is and we need to reflect on what the Prophet وسلم, was advising him to do and how we can comply with that and also in, in, in another hadith the Al-Bara ibn Azib narrates that he said, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, raitu nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wal Hassan ibn Ali ala atiqih. I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he was carrying al Hassan ibn Ali on his shoulders. And he was telling him, and he was saying, Allahumma inni uhibbuhu fa'ahibbah. Oh Allah, I love him, so love him. And again, we're seeing in this, a compliment of the previous hadith which is the Prophet ﷺ expressing verbally, publicly to Al Hassan ibn Ali that he loves him, that he has affection and care for his grandson. He's also making dua for him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves him as well. So that's another thing we learn from this hadith is to continuously make dua for our children. And that as their parents, our dua is mustajab for them. So we, we should encourage, we, we should be making dua for them. It also builds in them the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the love of the religion, the tradition of the religion, the continuous remembrance of Allah and dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the final thing we learn from this hadith is the Prophet ﷺ was carrying him on his shoulders. So this concept of playfulness, this concept of holding his grandson on his shoulders is again something we need to reflect on. How do we treat our children? How do we treat our grandchildren? How do we treat the children of those around us? Are we showing them this love and compassion and playfulness? And are we able to carry them on our shoulders? Or are we always very stringent and tough and, and making sure they're abiding by the rules without being able to, to be soft with them? Another reflection that Anas ibn Malik narrates is that he used to hear the Prophet وسلم, speak to <coughs> Zainab, not Zainab, his daughter, Zainab bin to Umm Salama as Yazuwainib. So the, 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 in Arabic, this is the small term of Zayn. And again, linguistically, it's, it's basically trying to address a smaller person. And it's not, it's not an official name of hers, it's not anything, but it's a way the Prophet wasallam is showing compassion. You know, when we, when we, when we give people nicknames, this is a form of nickname that the Prophet ﷺ was giving her. And again, a nickname gives a sense that the Prophet ﷺ is close to that person, is trying to come down to that person, is trying to relate to this person. And, and, and on that, again, another hadith that builds on this, and inshallah, a few other things we can extract from, is the Prophet ﷺ, Anas ibn Malik narrates that the Prophet ﷺ used to come and talk to us. And then he even came to my younger brother, 
And he said, Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'ala an Oh Abu Umair, what did the an do? So again, let's break down this few words. Prophet ﷺ had jawama' al-kalim. Few words with a lot of meaning. So let's break down these few words that the Prophet ﷺ said and what we can learn from them. First, he used the same uh, Umayr. Umayr is again a tasgheer of Umar. But he didn't just call, he didn't call him Umayr. His name was not Umayr. He called him Aba Umayr. He gave him a kunya of Abu, the father of. And in another narration, Anas ibn Malik says, if I remember correctly, that my brother was just at the age where he stopped breastfeeding. So he's a very young boy. And the Prophet ﷺ is already addressing him as Abu Umayr, father of Umayr. Obviously, he doesn't have a child named Umayr. Obviously, he's far from anything of that. But the Prophet ﷺ, again, showing respect and closeness and compassion to this young man, calling him Abu Umayr. It's a means of compassion, but it's also a means of lifting this boy up, showing him that he means something. Showing him that he is, like they say, he is somebody. He, he has a place in the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. He's not just a child or a small person who does not matter. But rather, he's treating him or he's addressing him almost as if he's an adult. Ya Aba Umi. The other part, ma fa'ala nughayr. The nughayr is a small bird, is a, is, a, is a type of small bird. And the Prophet ﷺ is asking him, Ma fa'ala nughayr. So again, many different excerpts we learn from Anas ibn Malik's narration of the Prophet ﷺ is that the Prophet ﷺ, A, must have seen him with a nughayr before. So this is not a first time, a one time thing that the Prophet ﷺ is, is coming and showing this playfulness with this young man. But he asked, he's asking him about a bird that he had. So he's, he obviously, this is not the first time. Obviously the Prophet ﷺ has seen this child before, has seen him playing with a bird before, had some form of interaction with him with this bird before. And the second is how the Prophet ﷺ got immersed into what matters to this child. When you think of the Prophet ﷺ and all the important things he had to do in his life. And as an adult, he had his own family to take care of. He had the ummah to take care of. He had the da'wah. He had, he had, he had, he had. But he found it was important to get himself attached to and ask this child about this pet bird that he saw him with before. And again, I, you know, imagine you are being asked, or me as an adult, being asked by someone about something that happened to me before that maybe I've forgotten about. Maybe I still remember. But just the idea of your brother or your sister remembering some details about you makes you feel that that person was listening, that that person cared about what you were doing and what you were talking about. And so the Prophet said, I'm doing this with this young boy again, shows the level that the Prophet ﷺ, how, how he really paid attention to these young children and how he got immersed in what they were doing to show their value in the society, to show how much they mean to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because, you know, we, we, we can talk about this in another uh, khutbah, inshallah, but we, we know sometimes how the Prophet ﷺ, many people used to say, the, the Sahabi used to say, we all used to think that the Prophet ﷺ loved us the most because of how he addressed us. We all used to, when the Prophet ﷺ used to talk to us, he used to turn to us. So he used to pay attention to us. He didn't kind of just listen to us as we're talking while he's looking elsewhere. Part of the adab of the Prophet ﷺ is he used to turn with his, his, his in, narration, in the narration, his, with his face or with his body to face the person who's talking, to give them that attention and that respect. But we see in these hadith that the Prophet wasallam used to also do that with the kids. He used to pay that level of attention with the kids. The 
last two incidents that are also related, or, or one incident with two ahadith that, that I wanted to mention is, many of us know the hadith that the Prophet وسلم, said that يُسَلِّمُ الصَّغِيرُ عَلَى الْكَبِيرُ وَالْمَارُ عَلَى الْقَاعِدُ وَالْقَلِيلُ عَلَى الْكَثِيرُ that the small person begins with salam to the older person. The younger person starts salam to the older person. The walking person starts with salam to the person who's standing or sitting in or stationary. And the few people give salam to the, begin the salam to the larger people. And in the next hadith, the Prophet wasallam also Anas ibn Malik narrates that the Prophet wasallam passed by some young men, some young children, and he initiated salam with them. And that Anas, sorry, Anas ibn Malik said, was, was once passing by a few young men, and he said salam to them. And when asked about this, Anas said, I used to see the Prophet ﷺ do this, and that's why I do it. And again, we see, okay, this is Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu an, as an older person, beginning salam with those who are younger. Obviously, the, the adab of the Prophet ﷺ in the previous hadith, he's still following the adab of the Prophet because the Prophet ﷺ said that the person who is walking says salam to the person who is stationary. And so you have a conflict here of the older person who is walking. So who starts salam? But to me, what is important in this hadith is we see, even when there's conflict, the initiative that the Prophet ﷺ took and Anas ibn Malik following in the Prophet's footsteps took to say salam to the youngsters when they passed them and not wait and expect that respect from the youngsters to say salam to them. And not to say what is right or what is wrong from a, a religious perspective, but wallahu alam inshallah they're both acceptable, but the initiative that the Prophet ﷺ took to begin those people with salam when he passed by them. To, which, which means, again, he passed by them, he approached them, he came close to them. So I hope we can learn from some of these ahadith, some of the, the characters of the Prophet ﷺ and how he dealt with the youngsters. Inshallah, in the second part of the khutbah, we'll reflect on that a little bit more. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man walah wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Again, summer is here. We have our, our, our youngsters, our children have some more time on their hands. And, and the reason I was sharing these ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is perhaps for us to take this opportunity when some of our children or younger brothers and sisters have more energy to, to get close to them. And it's important that we do this, again, to strengthen their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We saw many, exa we, 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 in the example of the hadith of Prophet sallallahu for his grandson was telling him that he loved him and making dua that Allah loves him. And we have other hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa telling Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, about a lot of characters and, and tying him back in يُعَلِّمُكُ kalimat and so on the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ was telling Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh to, to اِحْفَضَ اللَّهِ اِحْفَضَ Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and take, be care, take care of your religion and your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will do so for you. So the first important thing that we want to do out of this is to tie our children with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the deen. And the second is to strengthen our relationship with them. It's important that we have a strong relationship with our youngsters. We be role models for them. And, and we be at, at our best behavior and manner and we show them respect. Yes, the children are supposed to show the older ones respect, but there's a mercy, there's a, there's a respectful mercy that as adults and as older people, we need to show to our youngsters to build that relationship and so that they, we can be role models for them to learn from us. And, and the third is we hope, inshallah, that the, by, by this good behavior with them, by being role models for them, 
we build a stronger Muslim, a stronger character, someone who, has, who can do more. And one other reflection that I wanted to really insert here is, you know, I, I personally see this. I don't know how obvious it is or how evident, widespread it is. But I see in, in the West today, we have a huge movement of the involved father and how the uh, backwards mentality is, there, is, is being shifted and how fathers are getting involved with the families and, and, and. And there's nothing wrong with learning from others. There's nothing wrong. And I, and I think a lot of what's happening is, is Wallahu alam in the right step. But, it's, but first and foremost, we have the example of the Prophet Sallallahu in many ways doing things similar or in a different manner to what society's norms are moving towards today. And so I think what's first, first and foremost, we need to learn from the Prophet Sallallahu We need to learn the adab of our deen in dealing with one another. And then we can see how we can learn further some details or, or what matches from recent studies or, or society around us. If there are cultural norms that do not go against what our religion uh, uh, asks us to do, then we embrace those. And again, the example of the Arabi, the first hadith that I mentioned, there was a cultural norm in the Bedouins that they do not really show this compassion and love for their children. And we don't have to go back to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu We can probably see this in generations. I'm sure many of the people I'm talking to here, I hope maybe you haven't experienced this yourself, but I'm sure if you look around you and you ask around you, it'll tell you some people, my father never once told me how much I meant him, never once showed me how a form of affection. And this again, reflecting on that hadith, if our cultural norm doesn't, is not in line with what Islam tells us to do, with what the Prophet ﷺ did, we need to reevaluate our cultural norms. Our religious obligations come first, our cultural norms are okay as long as they are in line with that. And, and on that as well is the morals, the right and wrong in society changes. Depending on the majority of society, you're gonna see what is acceptable shift and drift, sometimes better, sometimes worse. But it's important that our moral compass stays with our religion and, and that that doesn't shift. Alhamdulillah, our religion has you know, a, a window of what is permissible and what is acceptable. But all of that is within the moral compass of our religion. And, if, and again, if anything falls outside that, even if it's okay in today's norms and cultures, w that doesn't mean we follow that. That does not mean we comply with that and we go back to the norms of our culture, uh, of our religion and, and what is right and wrong as in our religion. The, I, I just wanted to, in the interest of time, reflect on perhaps two items that we can um, learn from the Prophet Sallallahu as well, in addition to the hadith that I mentioned. Um, two incidents that I think um, are, are back to the same top, we'll, we'll, we'll funnel into one topic, which is trying to show our youngsters, um, give them a form of responsibility that is fitting to their age. So in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ tells us to start ordering the children to pray at seven and to hold them accountable at 10. This is a form of, of wisdom that the Prophet ﷺ is sharing with us, that at the age of seven, they're old enough to understand prayer. They're old enough to be able to perform prayers and they should perform every prayer with us. But in the wisdom of the Prophet Sallallahu and our deen is that perhaps at the age of seven to 10, they might not have that level of persistence that we can hold them accountable if they miss a salah or something like that. So it's important that we give them responsibility. We give them um, stuff to basically do to hold, to, 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 to work towards and responsibilities, 
but also that we do not overload them on the flip side. And the other example of that that I wanted to mention is the Prophet ﷺ in Badr. Some youngsters came to the Prophet ﷺ asking to join. And the Prophet ﷺ turned them away. And they were sad. And mashallah, you know, if we have in our day today that someone that's sad because they're too young to be recruited, uh, then, then I think we're in a good place. But we see on the flip side, Usama ibn Zayd being perhaps not much older, but at the end of the Prophet Sallallahu lifetime, just a little bit older, Usama ibn Zayd being given the rank of leading an army. And again, the Prophet Sallallahu wouldn't do this if he didn't know Usama's age allowed him to do so. And Usama's level of responsibility and that Usama radiallahu anhu had previously gone through other experiences, other responsibilities that showed he was capable. So I think with this, you know, another form of how we can build the character of our, of our youngsters, how we can make them independent and teach them independence is giving them responsibility, but also not overbearing them with responsibility. It's, it's unfair to ask them of something that they can't do. And again, how are we going to know what they are capable and not capable of without constantly being interacting with them, knowing about them? And again, the example of the Prophet ﷺ with Aba Umayr about the bird, he knew about this, sahab, this, this young Sahabi at the time. He knew about him. He knew a lot of things about him. It wasn't just a one time passing in the street and, and, and that's it. If you really think about the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ knew these young Sahaba perhaps just like he knew the older Sahab. And he knew what mattered to them. He was involved in what mattered to them. And with that, he was able to know step by step how he can increase the level of responsibility that he can give to these young Sahaba without overloading them and overbearing them. Ibadallah, inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-Nabi Ya ayu aladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ala Muhammadin kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم ارض عن الصحابة أجمعين وعن التابعين وتابعين بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وعنا معهم برحمتك وفضلك وجودك يا أكرم الأكرمين اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فعفو عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فعفو عنا اللهم إنك عفو تحب العفو فعفو عنا اللهم ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكوننا من الخاسرين اللهم ازرع في قلوبنا حبك وحب نبيك وحب من يحبك يا الله اللهم اجعلنا من أصحاب الجنة من أصحاب الفردوس Oh Allah we ask you to forgive our sins Oh Allah we ask you to instill in us the love of you the love of your Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and the love of those who love you We ask you oh Allah سبحانه وتعالى to make us of the, the people of Jannah of the people of Firdaus We ask you oh Allah سبحانه وتعالى to help us elevate one another to show love and respect to one another and to be able to be a good role model for our children, for our young brothers and sisters. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the reward of raising them and bringing up their character and their morals. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to forgive our shortcomings in what we are teaching them and how we are bringing them up. Ibadallah, inna Allah yamaru bil adli wal ihsani wa ita'i dil qurba wa yinha an al-fahshai wal munkari wal baghi ya'idhukum la'alakum tadakkaroon wa aqimu salah. Allah